Get ready to meet the trailblazers driving the human change behind our clean energy future. This week, our trailblazers are Kirsty Gogan, co-founder of Energy for Humanity and managing partner at Lucid Catalyst, alongside Dr. Rita Barronwall, former Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy in the US Department of Energy and now VP of Nuclear at the Electric Power Research Institute. These two formidable nuclear energy experts explain why nuclear as a clean energy is so often left out of the conversation. And more importantly, why we have no choice but to include it in the mix of transition fuels that will get us to a net zero future. With a population of 10 billion by 2050 and renewables taking up more space than we can accommodate, nuclear is the missing piece that decision makers just can't seem to make peace with. Kirsty and Rita are absolute powerhouses, trailblazing a new set of possibilities around nuclear. We're here to fuel a new energy conversation, and it starts with you. All right, well, Kirsty Gogan and Dr. Rita Barronwall, it is such a pleasure to have you with us on the Trailblazers series. Thank you so much for joining us and for being a part of this conversation. We were uh, talking a little bit offline uh, before we started just regarding the where, where the world finds itself in 2021 and, and observations around the pandemic and the challenges we've faced as a global community and lessons that can be drawn about climate change. And I thought we might start there, actually, you know, because when I think about the conversation over the last 18 months, I feel like the start of 2020 started with an enormous amount of momentum around the climate conversation. Certainly in Australia, we had, had fires burning like we'd never seen before. We felt like there was a level of public consciousness and debate that was happening. And then we found ourselves in a pandemic and the focus has absolutely gone to the public health urgency. But I'm interested from both of you, you know, what observations have you got and, and lessons do you think we can draw about progressing climate change from what we've watched the world work its way through over the last 18 months for better and for worse. Kirsty, I might come to you first. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot to learn, isn't there? Um, I'm sure we'll be reflecting on this for a long time to come. Um, I remember early on having an insight or a sort of, you know, noticing that um, even though we were sort of facing this kind of like tsunami of like cases coming towards us in Europe um, and we were sort of two weeks away from this great risk, we, we remained in denial about it and we didn't really act until it was too late. And I thought, wow, if we can't sort of respond to a risk that's two weeks away, what hope do we have with, a, you know, an emergency like climate change that's, you know, a much more long term uh, strategic challenge for our sort of poor human brains, you know. Um, and then more recently, I was thinking, well, you know, actually, we've done incredibly well in many ways, the way that the scientific community sort of really responded incredibly well to kind of coordinate globally and produce the vaccine in just unbelievably record time. Um, and it shows that we can actually respond very effectively um, to an emergency when we act like it's an emergency. And the thing about climate is that we call it an emergency, but we really do need to act like it as well. Definitely. And we had a conversation as part of this series already with Seth Godin. He was saying that that nomenclature, that language that we talk about climate mm. with is part of the problem. He said, global warming, not such a bad idea. You know, that idea of climate cancer, climate emergency, to your point around the urgency, needing to come a little bit more to the fore in the way that we talk about it to get that prioritisation. Rita, what would you add? What are, what are your reflections on the last 12, 18 months? I mean, uh, yeah, just to add on to what Kirsty had said was really um, what I've observed over the past year and a half is that when things are hitting close to home or hitting home is really, really when we start to react. And when we think about extreme weather events that are happening across the globe, Holly, you mentioned the, the fires in Australia. Um, there are extreme weather events happening with respect to heat. Uh, hurricanes, um, freezing, and unfortunately, until it, it hits close to home, uh, that's you know it, it doesn't it doesn't really sink in that something needs to be done, and ultimately this this needs to lead to wider public acceptance and willingness to to regard decarbonization and economic growth is, is being complimentary. Absolutely. And I think you're right, you know, that, that kind of false binary we've seen ourselves in with health and economics is a similar one often to the conversation we find ourselves in on climate. Oh, and you know, and actually that reminds me that, you know, it, there's also this really interesting um, effect that over COVID we've all adapted incredibly well to new norms. So, you know, we're using, we're wearing face masks, social distancing, um, and if you told us, you know, like two years ago that that's what we would be doing, it would have been really difficult to imagine that this, you know, global change has, has happened and we've absorbed it and normalized it. 
And I think that's also one of the dangers with climate, that it's, it's a slow moving emergency. And actually what we do is adapt very quickly to new circumstances and, you know, extreme weather events and especially the wealthy people who are insulated, you know, from the effects of those, um, you know, e extreme um, effects of climate change. Um, we will adapt and will normalize and even something, you know, even conditions 10 years ago seem like a lifetime away and we forget. And I think this is where leadership is incredibly important. We need our lead, it's our, the job of our leaders to pay attention to these changes, to track these changes, to anticipate what's coming and to respond accordingly. Absolutely. Now, I feel so blessed to have the opportunity to pick the brains of two incredible nuclear experts, and I found it fascinating researching you both. So before we jump into nuclear's role in the climate conversation, I, I want to give people a little bit of a context for how you both ended up in the fields that you're in. Uh, Kirsty, I might come to you first. I was reading that you actually grew up as sort of a hardcore environmentalist. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And you considered yeah. yourself initially sort of anti-nuclear by default. And then there was a book that you got given called Sustainable Energy Without Hot Air by David McKay. Can you talk about why that book changed your view on nuclear and changed your career trajectory? Yeah, I'm, well, I was given the book as a wedding present, um, <laughs> a slightly odd wedding present, uh, from my now husband's aunt, who was very good friends with uh, Professor Sir David McKay. And um, I thought, well, I'll pay attention to this because it's, you know, wedding present. And I found sort of two key insights. I was already worried about climate, obviously, and uh, David very cleverly number crunches through um, uh, what it would take to address our carbon reduction targets at the time, 80% reduction by 2050 using existing technology. And he uses these very simple graphics which, which map the land use requirements or the sea requirements that would be needed and it was basically oh all of our agricultural land in the UK would need to be you know used up for biofuels and and wind turbines and renewables and other technologies um, assuming that we went down that path and this was decarbonizing the whole economy don't forget too this isn't just mm. about the electricity sector this is like you know transport and heat and industry and it made me realize or question for the first time whether we could actually get all the way to zero just with renewables alone. That was the first key insight. And the second was that, you know, the information that he included about nuclear energy really contradicted everything I thought I knew um, about nuclear as a sort of by default anti-nuclear, you know, environmentalist. Um, and I realized that actually I'd never really, um, you know, investigated it. I just sort of absorbed this position as part of my identity without ever really kind of interrogating um, the, the, the the sort of science or, you know, the facts. And so I spent the next several years kind of, you know, becoming more educated and finding um, that many of the things I thought I knew were turned out not to be true. Um, so I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert. Rita really is the expert here about nuclear energy, but <laughs> I guess it's my job to sort of help um, you know, encourage other people to do the same, to sort of, you know, uh, do some reading and come to their own conclusions. Love that. And I want to come back to myths and dispelling myths in a second. But Rita, I found it really interesting reading an interview where you'd said you, you kind of got involved in nuclear by happenstance. How do you fall into nuclear energy? How does that even happen? <laughs> well, uh, my first uh, job after graduate school um, where I had studied materials engineering and was actually fabricating nanoparticles. Um, my first job after that was to use that type of technology to develop new nuclear fuel for the U.S. Navy. And so um, that is really what was my foray into this sector. I loved what I got to do uh, and the fact that uh, at one point in my career, while I was working for Bettis Atomic Power Laboratory, which is in the U.S., um, was able to go to see a aircraft carrier being constructed and being able to stand inside of where the reactor was going to be placed and realize that this little bit of fuel, you know, I have a prop here, but something that's you know this small um, can power this behemoth of a ship was to me absolutely uh, mind-blowing and, and awesome in the true sense of the word. And I realized that this is where I wanted to, to spend my career. Um, and then we fast forward to today and we are in the emergency that Kirsty mentioned. 
a climate emergency and nuclear energy absolutely can continue to be part of the solution. It's always been a clean energy source and can continue to be part of it. Um, I think none of us here are going to advocate that it should be 100% of anybody's energy portfolio. That is not what we're saying but it needs to be part of the conversation and absolutely part of that portfolio. And to your point around part of the conversation, I feel it's an interesting one in the conversation. We were reflecting before we started um, the, the our recording today that, you know, within the, new, within the, the energy conversation, it's, uh, often not present. If it is, it's quite contentious. There's a lot. Uh, there's a low level of public trust often around the conversation we have in this area. There's a lot of heated debate. There's a lot of controversy. So I guess I did want to start. You know, Chris, you talked about these contradictions. You know, that it contradicted everything you thought you knew about nuclear. I'd love each of you just. What's one myth you would love to dispel for our audience about nuclear today? And what's one truth or fact you'd love to establish? And Rita, I might come to you first. What's a what's a myth and a truth that you'd like to share about nuclear? Um, one myth would be that there is a, that the myth is that there's a problem with the used fuel that that comes from commercial nuclear power plants. Um, that the common term is the waste that comes from the power plants. I have grown up uh, working in nuclear fuel my entire life, and honestly, we use 5% of that fuel. So 95% is really untapped. And if we go to, for example, an eBay analogy, that fuel, if we were able to sell it on eBay, would be slightly used, right? It would be almost new in box. Um, and so to me, uh, it's a shame that we, can, we use something 5% and consider it already used or waste. So that's one. And, and to elaborate on the waste piece, there's not an issue with it. It is safely stored uh, in, in spent fuel pools and in dry casks all around the world at utility sites and repositories. And, and there isn't an issue. And so that's one myth. Um, one truth, I could go on about the <laughs> truth, but you've limit, limited me to one, um, is that um, it is a clean energy source. It always has been. And uh, as long as the physics don't change, and I can't envision that it will, it always will be. Um, and it, it's, it's a source, at least in the United States, that has operated quietly for decades. Um, I get my electricity from nuclear power. Um, my neighbors don't even know that the plant that is, you know, uh, tens of miles down the road is where their, their lights get powered from. Um, so, so what we do, we do it well, we do it quietly. Sometimes doing it quietly is to our de detriment, but we can get to that. I would love to come back to communication a little bit later and just uh, whether whether or not the industry almost needs a, a rebrand uh, or uh, some better communication around it. But Kirsty, I'd love your thoughts, a myth and a truth on nuclear. Yeah, it's so hard to choose one, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so I, I, I'm trying to choose between the myth that nuclear is expensive or the myth that we don't need it. I'm going to choose the myth that, that we don't need it, that we're doing fine without nuclear. Now, this, like Rita said, this isn't advocating for one thing versus another thing. The truth is that we have been really successful at building public and political support for action on climate for the past 30 years. And in the past 30 years, half of the emissions that are in the atmosphere right now, we've emitted in the last 30 years, right? So emissions are just going up year on year. On, they've bounced back to record levels now as the economies are starting to recover post-COVID. We're just not doing it. And, you know, we've, we've, the, the climate discourse has been very determined in um, advocating for a certain set of solutions for climate and demonstrated that it's possible to drive down costs and increase rates of deployment for those technologies and make some impact. And if we did the same, if we applied the same creativity and determination to other low carbon technologies, then we could really make a big impact on this, on this problem. But there is a myth that we don't, need to, we don't need that technology. And I just, you know, I really think that's the most dangerous idea. You know, we should be asking... Under what circumstances would everyone be really comfortable in a 5,000 reactor world? And let's design for that, you know, and rather than saying, I don't like the waste, so I'm, I don't want to have it. So that's the first one. Um, and the second, I guess the truth, um, uh, the truth, I guess, would be, um, well, actually, I, I loved what Rita said about this little pellet that you showed us powering a whole ship. <laughs> it's, 
You know what that it's Rita's holding incredible. up almost a pamphlet for those who are listening yeah. to this on podcast version. It's it's next to nothing in terms of the size. It's it's like a I think a, like a gummy bear. I I think Isodope describes it as, right? So, you know, as an environmentalist coming to nuclear energy and learning about it, it was the energy density for me that really got me to because um it's it creates civilization scale energy and enables with a tiny environmental footprint and that means that there is room for civilization and protecting nature and you know that's that's what we need and that's that's a way in which we can have a large population that you know has access to good food and travel and quality of life and can live secure long productive lives whilst protecting nature so it's a, it's the greenest technology <laughs> And, and the way you've described it, sort of the, the the misinformation that exists out there and the misconceptions, I guess if you talk about the role that nuclear is playing in energy generation right now and, and where you would argue it needs to be as part of a portfolio designed to enable a low-carbon future, what's the gap? Is there a challenge around the fact that there's enormous resistance? Is the challenge the public trust? Is the challenge the technology itself? Can you help us identify kind of what might be stopping nuclear from playing a more prominent role than it is in climate conversations? Or is it, but it's just not one the public are hearing? So um, I I can start on that. The the first one is something that Christy did touch on, which is uh, the cost. Um, to build new nuclear is not a, uh, a, a inexpensive endeavor, but the least expensive way to decarbonize our energy economy is to keep existing plants running. By far, they've already been built. They're, they're operating smoothly. You let them continue to operate, and unfortunately. Um, in the United States, as well as other countries around the world, there are decisions being made to close existing nuclear power plants prematurely based on uh, economic considerations for the market or on policy. It is not a technical decision for almost every single closure that we have seen in the past uh, 10 years. And so if we can change that uh, trajectory and allow these plants to continue operating. And by the way, there are regulators in every country that ensure the safe operation um, for each of these reactors. So it's not that any particular plant can just continue to operate on its own. It is a highly regulated industry as well, cradle to grave. So, you know, everything um, is, is, is being watched and followed. So if we can just allow those plants to continue to operate to their planned lifetime um, and their licensed lifetime, that would certainly help. And I'm interested on that too, Rita. I read uh, somewhere you saying sort of we need to challenge the way people are, are talking about cost too. And if you're talking about value over 40, 50 years, that the economics of nuclear fundamentally change. So is part of it the fact we're trapped in almost this short termism, whether it's electoral cycles, whether it's kind of, you know, the, this idea of comparing year on year, quarter on quarter. Um, is that part of the mindset we've got to break free of as we think about what really infrastructure wise we need to be reliant on in order to move towards a more sustainable future? I think so. Absolutely. So let me let me pick on the United States um, for a minute. We we are very much in the mindset of quarter on quarter, um, you know, profits or, or losses. And when you look at what's happening with the new builds in China, I, I really think that the difference in mentality in terms of the broad range thinking of the culture, which thinks not in quarters or even decades, but centuries or, or you know generations and centuries um i think that's what's helping lead to that the prosperity that um we're seeing with the new builds in china um, so there is that piece of making sure that the plant is valued over its entire lifetime we've got 40 60 80 and talk of even 100 year lifetimes and, and so when you you know extrapolate the value over a century that's fantastic Absolutely. And Kirsty, I know, you know, economics and business models is something you're really interested in this space too. You've involved in a venture that's focused on enabling universal access to clean and to cheap energy whilst tackling climate change um, within those urgent timescales, because you believe unless we can make nuclear investable and commercially viable, that we're not going to change the conversation. Can you, can you talk about the role of kind of the economics in this bigger picture? Yeah, I mean, uh- so, you know, nuclear, uh, the nuclear industry has, you know, um, for very understandable reasons, uh, gone down the path of building incredibly large 
you know, gigawatt scale uh, reactors that, as Rita was saying, are basically gifts to our grandchildren, right? <laughs> They're going to have clean, reliable electricity for decades and decades to come. But to build those, you have to make a very large upfront capital investment. It's a big hump of investment to get over. And then after that, the operating costs are very low and they will run for decades very reliably. And can you ground us in some of the mechanics on that? What would be a typical lifetime of a nuclear plant and what might that upfront investment be? Just so our audience listening who might not have a scale for this can get some sense. Well, so, I mean, it varies a lot. And the interesting thing is actually what a wide range of cost outcomes there have been globally around the world today. Um, uh, The majority of nuclear plants are being built. So we're talking about gigawatt scale plants being delivered for less than $4,000 a kilowatt, which is actually pretty good value, pretty comparable to, you know, other, uh, both fossil fuel and, and renewables projects. But there are some outlier projects that have been built recently or in the process of being built in the United States and Europe that are more like $12,000 a kilowatt. And the reason for that is because they're the first big, complex infrastructure projects of that kind that we've built in a generation. And in order to achieve that, you have to make a really big investment. Like Rita said, you know, you have to make a big investment in licensing your design um, with an inexperienced regulator, uh, training your workforce, qualifying your supply chain, gaining experience as a project leadership team, setting up your site. You know, the whole thing is a huge undertaking. And many of those costs, many of those, that, that m- much of that money that you need to spend the first time you do it, you don't have to spend again when you build the next one. And so in the UK, for example, we're building two units on a site and it's a famously expensive project, but the majority of the cost is actually in setting up, getting ready to build the first one and then building it for the first time and learning how to do it. And the next, the second unit that's now being built is going incredibly fast and will represent a much lower cost. And if we kept going with that same design and built a a second plant, Ideally, with multiple units on a single site, we would start to see those very low costs, less than $4,000 a kilowatt that we're seeing elsewhere in the world, where they've already established that kind of drumbeat, uh, the programmatic effect, we call it. And that's for traditional construction. If you take this to its logical conclusion and move away from low productivity, traditional construction, which is, you know, you're out in a, you've got 5,000 guys in a field, right, building in all kinds of weather or whatever, um, you move into a factory-based environment with, you know, all kinds of automation and parallelization and, you know, automated welding and all kinds of efficiencies built in, then you can start to reduce your schedule dramatically and reduce your cost of delivery again and get into the realms of, you know, $2,000, $3,000 a kilowatt. And then you start to be very, very competitive, even with renewables. And that's basically what wind and solar have done. They've They've, they've modularized their designs and moved into high productivity manufacturing environments. Rita, you look like you wanted to jump in there. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I was just, I, I think that's, that's really key is, is the first of a kind needs to be built and, and, and demonstrated. And then there's, there's so much interest around the world um, in terms of new nuclear build. It's just, you know, I think rightfully so many of these entities don't want to be the first uh, in line, they'll, they'll certainly be in line for the second, third, tenth of a kind. Um, but uh, the, the demand for new nuclear is definitely out there, and it's a really exciting time for us to be in this industry. And Kirsty, I know Rita offered up cost as kind of her um, view on one of the things that is the barrier between where nuclear is right now and the role it might play in a low carbon future. What would you add to the conversation there? What, what else do you see as a barrier? Well, um, I think as Rita said, there's a lot of interest around the world um, uh, in moving away from fossil fuels and recognizing that nuclear technologies can can play a really important role, not just in electricity generation, but in a whole range of attributes. Because nuclear plants produce potentially low cost electricity, but also heat. And that can be used, very useful for making hydrogen, for example, or supplying heat directly to industrial processes. And the, the real challenge, I think, is, is twofold. Firstly, understanding these cost drivers, understanding how the delivery of your project can dramatically affect your cost outcome. Um, and secondly, 
a lack of awareness about the very broad range of applications to, that could help us address the really tough to decarbonize parts of the problem. You know, electricity is 20% of our energy use. What about the other 80%? We don't really know how to solve that, especially heavy transport like shipping and aviation. And we see huge potential for nuclear technologies. And I know Rita as you know is, is the expert on this. <laughs> and and we are working on efforts to uh, look at decarbonizing the shipping industry. Um, there's so much excitement around electric vehicles, but something has to produce that electricity for us to power our EVs. And nuclear absolutely can play a part in that. Um, Kirsty mentioned hydrogen, but there's also um, the ability to desalinate water using nuclear power plants, which currently the desalination process is very fossil intensive. So if you're building new nuclear, um, not only producing electricity for a community, but also being able to desalinate water cleanly, that's a that's a win win. Absolutely. And I read an interview, Rita, where you'd said like the growing demand for that and where that's likely to be at by 20, uh, I think you'd said 2025. At the moment, we're desalinating about 10 trillion gallons or 38 trillion liters for those that are in the metric world. Um, but the experts predicting it's going to get to about 500 trillion gallons by 2025. So the demand, even with what you were talking about with COVID earlier was making me think if we've got these new urgency drivers with, with demand like that, population, et cetera, is it going to force our hand on this conversation? in a way that maybe that slow moving conversation and prioritization to date hasn't. Yeah, I mean, I, and, you know, I think that beginning to sort of um, match up the uh, increasing energy demand, partly as a result of climate impacts, you know, heat, the growth of air conditioning is going to be like, is mm. going to become a major fraction of our uh, of our energy consumption in the future, for example, and desalination and, you know, and food security, all of these things are going to be very energy intensive as we try to respond to these climate effects. Um, and one thing I think that is another barrier to, um, you know, really sort of realizing this transformative potential of nuclear technologies to contribute towards these big challenges is the absence in energy systems modeling which I'm sorry if this is really geeky, but, you know, all of these kind of net zero pathways and net zero targets that our politicians sign up to and that, um, you know, we set ourselves as countries to get to zero by the X date, they're all informed by energy systems modeling. And the energy systems modeling, firstly, either misrepresents, underestimates, or is completely, you know, excluding nuclear technologies. If it does include it, it's often the, only the very expensive, first-of-a-kind project that never sees cost reduction and just a flat line across the top of the chart while all the other technologies come down in cost with deployment apart from nuclear. And mostly these applications that we're describing, desalination, direct air capture, very you know important and useful things, including hydrogen production, synthetic fuels production, they're just not included, they're not represented. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to change that because those scenarios, we've, we've done some modeling and it's, it shows that we can de-scope, de-risk, and lower the cost of achieving net zero if we do include these applications. Um, and it's through this modeling that hopefully our politicians will first will begin to, you know, uh, respond accordingly, and also that investors will start to be more confident in um, commercializing these technologies. I'm interested with both of you talking about cost, uh, regulation, and you know, absolutely necessarily the level of skills and specialization involved in this is one of the challenges for us as a global community moving forward. If if we take the premise that nuclear does need to be more involved in the energy footprint of the world and, and therefore by extension of that individual countries, that this creates a little bit of a divide between developed and developing countries. Is this as accessible an idea for the developing world? And do we need to be thinking about how we make that, well, the accessibility, the energy, the transfer of the knowledge, et cetera? I'd just be interested for your observations on, is this a first world conversation or a developed country conversation? Or are we already seeing this um, this very much a live conversation in the developing world? So I think it's both, and it's really exciting. Um, there is so much interest from, from developing countries who appreciate the value that a nuclear power plant can deliver to their community. Um, given that we have a variety of sizes in a reactor portfolio, from a micro reactor for a very small community in a microgrid to a small modular reactor to the traditional 
large gigawatt size reactors. These, these um, communities and countries are assessing what might be the right fit for them. They might start out um, at, at one size and then start to augment if, if that's the path they choose to take. But what I have found um, over my pre-pandemic uh, travels, um, speaking to university students around the world, is the excitement that these students have. They're going to pursue careers in the nuclear energy industry and their countries, their home countries at the moment have no place for them to go and work. And so they're, they're looking for opportunities to go abroad, apply what they have learned in school, and then come back and assist with bringing a new power plant um, up and, and starting to run it. And so to me, to have that kind of groundswell from students who, who don't necessarily have um, you know, a, an opportunity at the moment, um, to me, speaks volumes about the nature of this technology and, and the future of our workforce as well. Without question. Now, I know we touched on it earlier, the communication side, but I'm just going to come out and ask it. Does nuclear have an image problem? Like when people think about it, is part of our challenge that it's anchored in Chernobyl and Fukushima or, or that, you know, a generation that grew up on The Simpsons think about Homer floating around the power plant with his plutonium? Uh, is one of the challenges we've got needing to either kind of reclaim the energy conversation or, or you know, reinform it? And how do we do that? Um, why has that not happened to date? I think that's changing. Um, I really do. I think, you know, um, my colleague, Eric, he, d he describes the nuclear industry, or has described the nuclear industry as like, they're like apartment building owners <laughs> in a way when, you know, we talked earlier about how the plants operate for decades, you know, 60 years plus. And I think as a result, it's kind of, it created a kind of culture in the industry of being a kind of operating culture rather than a sort of future-oriented, innovative culture. And um, uh, that was kind of, that's understandable, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's changing now. There's, there's um, I think, just a hugely growing recognition that these technologies are going to be incredibly valuable and useful. Um, the conventional existing gigawatt scale light water reactors um, are even much more versatile than we ever really gave them credit for. Um, even in the US, those plants that are under economic stress that are, you know, diversifying their value proposition to produce hydrogen and heat and desalination um, um, and the new technologies that are coming to market this decade, the emerging technologies that really are not your grandfather's technology um, from, you know, the 1950s, but have entirely different characteristics and a much broader range of applications. They're they're coming really in all, all different shapes and sizes and are being developed by, you know, entrepreneurs and businesses that are really focused on making real contributions towards solving our global challenges. And if I can just bolt on a quick answer to your previous question as well about the developed and developing world, you know, I, th I do think we need to apply creativity to the delivery of these technologies you know, there tends to be in the in the sector a big emphasis on the kind of reactor technologies and the the technical the technical engineering side, which you know is wonderful. But I think in order for these products to be really useful, we have to design them for markets um, that we're delivering them to, and um, that means thinking really carefully about the regulatory environment, about the you know skills and supply chain capabilities within these markets, and you know what services these technologies could could supply. So, for example, if you look at the potential to make really large scale synthetic fuels like ammonia, you could be, you know, you could have like a very large scale operation, a gigafactory, we would call it, making a lot of ammonia that's being then imported to developing countries, you know, like Ghana and Kenya that currently have, a, you know, spend a billion dollars a year on importing oil for decentralized diesel generators, you know, and create a rapid switch decarbonization um, sort of indirectly, um, but also develop technologies for, for use in those economies and those, and those markets that don't necessarily have the same sort of burdensome, decades-long regulatory uh, oversight requirements that the, the, the old technologies needed. Rita, um, we touched on their communication and uh, Kirsty brought into the conversation creativity. I want to bring a third C in, if I can, uh, collaboration. So I found it really interesting when you stepped into the role of Assistant Secretary um, that you said the biggest barrier was trying to get many the many entities involved in nuclear technology to collaborate. 
Why is that collaboration so tricky and what have you learned about what it takes to do it well? It, it takes, it, you know, it, it takes a lot of hands to, to be successful and there is not one single entity that can do it alone. Um, communicating, if you're developing a new product, a new reactor, communicating with the regulatory body, um, communicating with your supply chain that's going to eventually produce this, either it's a component or the reactor for you. Um, they may have new um, ideas about design, about manufacturing improvements that we may not have thought of while we're trying to just design and work around the physics of the plant. And so collaborating with all of those entities and especially who your end user is, to Kirstie's point, making sure we're developing for the right market is really, really important. Um, and, and so these technologies are amenable to being, in a way, um, you know, tweaked to, to, to meet the needs of a particular market. And so that's, that is one of the, the attractive pieces um, of the technology as well. But I think um, uh, absolutely it's, it's, it's important for us to, to, to give these areas um, some, some more thought. Yeah. And Christy, any similar lessons with the Low Carbon Alliance and the, the you know, community there that you've created <laughs> with nuclear renewables, carbon capture, storage industries? You've got more than a thousand businesses, I think, from my understanding, and you've had the endorsement of Greenpeace, which I would have thought may not be all that common in this particular area. What have you learned about effective collaboration through, through establishing that alliance? Yeah, collaboration is king, definitely. And well, and complementary. Here's another C for you, right? Hey, so the C's you know, the, today. the idea that nuclear and renewables can actually work really, really well together, and um, you know, increase the overall performance of this, improve the overall performance of the system in terms of the things that we care about, which is you know, being reliable and affordable and clean, right? That's what we want from our energy. Um, ultimately, like Rita said in the beginning, you know, the majority of people. Don't pay that much attention, as much attention as we do to, you know, the source of the energy. They just want to know that it's going to be there and it's affordable, and um, and that it's not contributing to to major, you know, environmental um, issues. And what we find is that if you can integrate um, uh, advanced reactors, for example, with thermal energy storage, enabling them to, you know, be very flexible generators. That enables really high penetrations of variable renewables into the electricity grids, um, but enables you know a kind of very complementary whole system performance um, with that dispatchable clean generator. And right now, most of the energy systems modeling assumes that we'll meet any we'll, we'll sort of balance the grid with gas rather than with clean sources. So, I, you know, I I do think that. Um, collaborating is really important. There's plenty of work to go around. And what I found with the Low Carbon Alliance was that when we did join forces with with the renewables um, advocates, we had the best attended events because everybody showed up. All the tribes, right? All the nuclear people and the renewables people packed rooms. We gained really good press coverage in the right wing media and the left wing media. There was something for everybody. <laughs> And, um, and it, it kind of opened people's eyes. You know, I had a lot of people commenting that, oh, I didn't know nuclear was low carbon. And they didn't realize it until they heard it from renewables. So it's, it's basically much more impactful when, you know, somebody from your own peer group or somebody that you trust, when a renewables advocate says we need nuclear in the mix, it can be a lot more powerful than when a nuclear person says it. No, I love that point. And, and that's at the heartbeat of our Energy Disruptor series, which I know both of you have been involved with, that idea of being keeping our ears open to rehearing things and relearning ideas that we might have had or um, stereotypes we might have held and making sure that we are evolving our view as the world continues to evolve and we need to rethink what solutions to problems can look like. I want to speak to you both about the idea of, of uh, being trailblazers. You're in this series because you're both trailblazers in the work that you do, um, the way that you show up, the way that you give voice to um, important ideas and conversations. And I guess individual questions for you. Rita, firstly, when you took over as Assistant Director for Nuclear Energy in the US, you were the first woman to lead the office. You're responsible for $1.3 billion portfolio to support the research and development of uh, advanced nuclear tech. Have you found it challenging over the course of your career to be pioneering differently 
um, you know, new ideas, new thought, new conversations. And are there, is there any advice you could offer to our listeners for what's enabled you to be a trailblazer, be it skills around resilience or strategies for maintaining that creativity inside sometimes very structured, very consistent traditional environments? It's, um, I think it, it, it really can be boiled down to being willing to take risks. And by the way, our industry is extremely risk averse, uh, but being willing to take risks, but being willing to be held accountable. And so every opportunity that I have, um, you know, kind of stuck my neck out and said, I'm going to go try this, let me try it. If it fails, it's on me and, and we'll move on. And that's happened time after time after time in my career. So not just saying, let me go try this, but saying, if it fails, it's my, you know, not necessarily my fault, but, but I'll take accountability for it. And, and having the courage to recognize that, that, yes, there are some propositions that we're endeavoring down or on and um, they, they might be fraught with risk, but, uh, you know, taking a calculated risk uh, and, and wanting to, you know, trying to propel our industry to, to be the best that it can be versus maintaining its status quo. And Rita, for you, where does that courage come from? Is that innate? Have you grown up with that level of preparedness to take those calculated risks? Or has that come from being well supported to do so and, and well mentored and sponsored over the course of your career? Or is there anything we can learn from that as well? What holds your feet to the fire, I guess, in those moments where sometimes it's so much easier to step back and go, you know what, maybe not today. It's, um, it, it was one of my eighth grade teachers who, uh, you know, who had a conference with my parents and said, you know, she's great. She's doing well in school. Don't worry. It's not about her grades. She's just very quiet. She needs to speak up more and, and share her thoughts more. And uh, me growing up in a traditional um, Asian household, you know, we went home after the meeting and my parents were like, you heard what the teacher said. You need to speak up more. And so I, I obeyed. And, and so <laughs> since then, it's just a matter of raising your hand, speaking your mind and, and being willing, again, being willing to face the consequences of what might you know, um, come out of that discussion or that hand raising, but understanding what those are and, um, you know, moving on. I love that you just took that on board, like a switch flicked in that moment being like, all right, off I go. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> That's brilliant. And I imagine that starts to a, to a degree as a discipline originally where you're making yourself do it and going, okay, every meeting I've got to put my hand up once I've got to say one thing and then it becomes easier and more natural over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, for for the longest time, it was definitely a stretch assignment, a stretch goal to to be able to participate in that capacity. But but I tell folks, you know, you are in meetings, you're in conversations for a reason, um, and and you know, contribute. And Kirsty, I guess the same question to you. But over your career, you've been very prepared to, I guess, make decisions that are sometimes perceived as counterintuitive, and to like what you talked about with the alliance to challenge tribal norms and bring people together in new configurations. You've had some environmental groups say you're a sellout and come and challenge you for the the, the way that you're going about doing things. How have you navigated pushback, and what strategies have you developed to be resilient um, as you pioneer a new way of doing things? Yeah, I, I guess I'm just so inspired by what Rita was just saying. <laughs> I want to go home and tell my daughter to, to speak up. And let's, like all of you listening, I hope you follow that advice because it's, it's just Absolutely. So, it's so good. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's clear that, Rita, what you also do is, you know, you come from this place of integrity. And, you know, I, th I think being sort of authentic and curious and having integrity is is a great way to um, open dialogue with people and form relationships with people. And, you know, that's, I think, one of the ways um, that hopefully I've been able to sort of navigate through some of these, these difficult, like you were saying, these kind of counterintuitive steps that I've taken in my career. Um, and I have been quite fortunate, really, because um, I think even though lots of people in my tribe were you know sort of unhappy uh with some of my choices um i've had many many people come and, and tell me that um because they they saw me doing that it it caused them to have pause and also you know look again at nuclear and read into it a bit more and um so you know if i've if i've prompted some people to do that then i'm i'm pleased and i think really it's about just being curious really and 
trying to keep a curious mind. It's a beginner's mind, they call it, I think, in Buddhism, when um, it allows you to hear new things and change your mind sometimes. And it can lead you in all kinds of unexpected directions. <laughs> I love it. We've had, we're adding kind of curiosity, uh, courage. I think it's a collection of C's this morning. And I love that piece around just that preparedness to, to speak up and persistently too, just showing up and continuing to say what you've got to say, knowing full well that you're not always going to have ears that are ready to hear it, but that you'll grow that level of community and understanding or thoughtfulness over time. So and thank I, you both think, for sharing that. Go for I it. I think Kissy. I've also had a lot of support from, you know, my, my friends and colleagues who've kind of like, and my husband and, you know, who've sort of lifted me up and enabled me and encouraged me. And, you know, I, I think it's really important that we do the same now for others. And I, I'm, I know Rita, you are, and, um, you know, that's, that's part of what enables that courage to actually bear fruit and, and bring good results. It's like what Rita said earlier too, you know, anything, anything significant takes many hands. So that idea that all of us are a collection of all the people in our lives too, who support and encourage us so much. So when we speak about that support and encouragement, I guess one of the things about this series is wanting to help empower uh, those listening to continue to be trailblazers in the way that they show up in the work that they do and also the way that they contribute to a more sustainable energy future. And sometimes when we talk about nuclear, I feel like it's one of those topics that a lot of people go, okay, that's definitely one above my pay grade, out of my remit, not one I can play a role in. So I guess I'd love to turn the conversation to you two. Those who've listened, we've, we'll have a whole gamut. We'll have people that are absolutely passionate, perhaps involved and entrenched in the sector. We'll also have a lot of listeners today who maybe this is one of the first conversations they've heard that has gone into this level of detail on nuclear technology and its possibility. What would you say to them about the role that they can play in this conversation and in the advancement of nuclear tech? The, some of the richest interactions that I have had in my career have been because the folks in the room had not been trained in nuclear engineering. They came from very different backgrounds. They had studied the language, you know, language arts. They had studied art history. Uh, they might have been scientists, but not engineers, finance folks. Having that diversity of thought is absolutely necessary for this industry to continue to thrive. And what we're starting to see now is um, a substantial number of folks that want to be part of this industry because they want to save the world. And to me, that is fantastic. And I welcome you with open arms. And there's a place for every single one of you to, to make a contribution to what we're doing. I love that that piece around the diversity of thought and perspective and that actually anyone, irrespective of whether you're technical, trained or otherwise, can have valuable ideas and insights bring, that they can bring to bear on this particular topic. Kirsty, what would you add to that? Well, yeah, so, you know, it's so funny because today I read this piece about, um, so the the England's doing quite well in, in the football at the moment. Um, and they are. Gareth Southgate, <laughs> who's the England manager, um, I, ho- I hope I'm not jinxing us talking about this before the, uh, the the final, but Gareth, we're very proud of getting as far as we have anyway. Any- so Gareth Southgate, the manager, um, has an advisory team who are made up of a cycling coach, a colonel, a rower, a tech entrepreneur, and a rugby coach. And he's completely broken the mold for his kind of advisors, which have always traditionally been, the England managers have always traditionally just had football experts and there's there's quite a lot of sort of interesting, um, you know, literature around this idea of diversity. That what you do is you just sort of reinforce a kind of homogenous view rather than bringing different perspectives. So I think diversity is absolutely key. And you know, there's an idea that we only need a certain skill set in the sector, um, which is very technical. And in fact, of course, what we need are lawyers and business experts, and we need. Um, you know, planners, and we need community um, engagement, engagement experts, and just so we need almost every kind of person to enable, you know, these technologies to be successful at the scale that we need. So we need, we need media experts like you, Holly, and we need events organizers. <laughs> so um, please, you know, bring your talents to bear. But I love that piece, not just around the, the notion of well, the notion of diverse talents around nuclear, but also that applicability for everyone listening to whatever contents you're leading in, the idea of diversifying the people that uh, you surround yourself with and who you're seeking yeah. to soundboard ideas off and get input from. I think that's such a universal piece of advice, what you've shared there. 
we've had such a wide ranging conversation and it's funny in thinking how to wrap it all up, uh, given what we've just touched on beautifully in terms of that uh, tools and ideas that can empower leaders. What I wanted to do is, I guess, ask both of you what we can do to spark conversation moving from our conversation to the conversations of dinner tables and boardroom tables and classroom tables of everyone listening to this podcast. So if you were to give someone a provocative statement or a favorite stat around nuclear energy or some little nugget that they could go and say, hey, guess what I learned and just casually drop on the table and invite a conversation, what would you offer up as a conversation starter so we can keep the conversation going about nuclear energy beyond this podcast? Rita, I'm going to come to you first. What's your, okay. your nugget for listeners to take away and use as their, their conversation spark? Oh, boy. I would say that um, nuclear energy generates 10% of the, the world's electricity, but is responsible for over 30% of the, the world's clean energy. And Kirsty, you might have these, those exact figures, so you can fill in the blanks, but it's it's a disproportionate amount of clean energy generation um, that, that nuclear provides. And, and we can certainly increase that. We're on track to do that around the world. And it's going to be a, a very exciting journey. 30% of clean energy. That'll be a good conversation starter in a number of different uh, offices and table settings right around the world. Kirsty, what would be your spark? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, uh, I don't know the exact figures. I think it's the second largest source of clean energy, though, isn't it? And the uh, after hydro, so um, I guess um, you know when we talk about climate action, we often think about firstly decarbonizing the electricity sector and then <clears throat> decarbonizing the rest. And there's only a very small number of you know wealthy modern industrialized nations that have actually got to zero or got you know fully clean electricity generating mix and I sometimes like to have a quiz to see if people can name which countries have already done that um, I'm in one of them right now which is Iceland that is very fortunate to have geothermal and Norway of course has hydro so they, they've both got their their very fortunate natural resources but the other handful of countries um, have done that with a mix of nuclear and renewables and I just don't think many people realize that, you know, that these, this is what success looks like. So Sweden, France, Switzerland, um, Brazil, and most recently, it's not a country, but it's a big economy. Ontario is, is, you know, the most recent nation or the most recent big economy to completely phase out coal. And it's done that. Thank you very much through a combination of nuclear and renewables. Um, so we, we can do it, but we need to acknowledge, you know, the important contribution that nuclear can make. I love that success looks like nuclear and just challenging the role that it's already playing uh, in solutions right around the world. Rita Barrymore, Kirsty Gogan, it's been such a treat to have you on Trailblazers. Thank you so much. I've learned an enormous amount. It's been such a pleasure to get to pick two extraordinary minds and such deep experts on this area. Thank you for the time that you've shared with us um, and the degree of sharing, the candor in the conversation. And thank you as well for your leadership in these conversations and spaces right around the world. Really appreciate it. Thanks. It's an honour. Thank you. Thanks to EY for partnering with us to amplify people following the path of most resistance. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and subscribe to the series. Are you a trailblazer or inspired by a trailblazer? Leave a comment. Let us know. Join the movement.